So, hello everyone. We're starting the third session of the symposium, which is entitled Nostalgia, Memory, and Hopeful Architecture. Um, I will be the chair for this session. Uh, and we have uh, Haya, who's here with us, who's going to start. And then we have Frederick Weissenborn, uh, Umayya Malaib, uh, Od Azzi, and Rula Salamoun, and finally Samir Aid. Uh, who, uh, they will each have a short presentation and then uh, we will take part in a conversation around the topic. Uh, so now I will introduce Haya, who is a Lebanese student currently uh, in her fourth year uh, at the AA. Uh, Haya completed her Riva Part 1 at the AA uh, in 2019 and received the High Pass with Commendation Award for her third year technical studies thesis. Her work focuses on materiality and developing innovative fabrication techniques in an attempt to find potential alternative design methods. So Haya, I give you the floor. You can share your screen if you want. Thank you, Diaz, for your introduction. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So Lebanon from Amnesty to Amnesia. I'm going to begin by giving you a general um, overview of uh, the history of our country. So the political events versus what's happening in the port at the same time. And so as you can see, we've been going through war, war corruption, occupation, conflict and war again, crises, revolution. And uh, we will be focusing today on the Beirut explosion, uh, which leads me to say Oh, sorry, it's lagging. So there is the problem that there's a crisis of everything in Lebanon happening. انه نحن اولاد الحرب وقد ايش شفنا بالحرب وركبنا على ملاجئ واكلنا صواريخ على البيت بس مثل هيدي الضربه عن جد هيدي بتسوى كل ايام الحرب بيفو اسيد دو غاردي لو بلوس بوسيبل طابع التراثي تبع هالمنطقه بس كالي يونيك سو وذ ذات That being said, how can we respond to a city in constant oppression? So I'm going to be taking you through my, um, my, my lens through the project, um, through a 19th century Lebanese home located in Jemaisia. So I call my project the Shadow of Beirut, the Material Register. So in the context of rebuilding Beirut post-explosion, How can we learn from prior techniques used in the practices of preservation and art reproduction to develop a material register across the city to tell the story of what happened? So um, the house is located um, on Pasteur Street, which is the street facing the port. And... Uh, What's what basically what happened in this area is you have the port, the highway that separates it, and then you have pubs, uh, parking spots, homes and galleries that basically are the rest of Beirut from that side. Um, this is the view from the house that I'm working in. Um, it's literally facing the explosion. This is, this is a view of the silos. And this is what it looked like um, as soon as the explosion happened. And some images, images that show the before. And <clears throat> what struck me is that I arrived to the house when the right side of the, uh, of the house was already done. So I hadn't seen what it looked like before live. And I thought to myself, well, I mean, it's an amazing job, really, but it's obliterating memory in some way. Um, so what I mean by that is this is a young woman, um, no, this is a woman that I visited and she was showing me this uh, shard. So this basically this glass shard that went from one end of the room to the end of the other, to the other room, pierced the clothing rack and she was telling me she wanted to keep it as a memory of what happened and she didn't want to remove it from there. So that got me to think, well, while rebuilding, we're actually removing 
some of the things that people don't really want to forget and something that actually people are not really forgetting. So if I take you through the building timeline, this building has been there since 1870, so approximately 160 years until it was completely exploded and demolished in 2020 and in the process of being revived today. Um, however, to understand what rebuilding is, I kind of wanted to understand what is a reproduction of something and at what point is it no longer a copy. So to do so, so, to do so I looked at an object and I kind of set the formula parameters for that specific object, which is color, size, material, context, and form. So this is the object. So this is the object I was working with. Uh, forget about what it really looks like. It's, it can be any object, but it's just to think about uh, the process of reproduction. Here you have an original copy. What difference does it make if you can't even tell if it's the same everything to the naked eye? Or a point cloud copy where you get all the information through data, digital data, or a deformed original. I call this the continent copy, which is same color, same material, same proportion, same weight, but totally different form. Or a different type of copy, which is the experiential copy, when you have the same item um, cut into pieces and you can reconfigure it wherever you want in the way that you want in the context that you desire. Or for instance, another form of copying, which is just changing the material, which leads to a whole different pro property set. Or the reproductive copy, which is same artifacts, same scales, uh, different scales and on repeat. So um, to apply it on Lebanon, this is the interior of the house that I'm currently working in. So um, one absolutely has to be truthful of the circumstances. So the idea of restoring something that obliterates memory is not the answer. It does not mean that there are no benefits in reconstructing the past in some way, as long as we understand that it is in fact a reproduction that it is a type of semblance of something catering to present interests, sentimentality, historism, fondness for old, as opposed to being a living embodiment of something. As long as there is a vigilance of our historical memory, any type of intervention matters, but the key is to make people aware. So let me just say briefly that uh, the first law of, of preservation ever defined was in 1790 after the French Revolution, and the second one was after a most, the most intense moment intense moment of civilization in 1877, which brings me to think that you only think of preserving something after it's been taken away from you, really. So to also look at preservation, you have to kind of understand the materiality because that's kind of one of the constraints that comes with cultural heritage. Uh, this is specific to Lebanon. So they used to, in the 19th century, they, they used to use uh, stone which is the material that uh, the, the house I'm working in is made out of. And then they started using cement, which, which then increased the amount of import and mass production, and which led to the production of an artificial stone, which is described actually to be less of an imitation, but more of an interface between buildings and designers. Uh, so uh, this is a catalog of different ornaments that have been produced back in the days to produce ornaments for the house in cement. Uh, so that's what led to a mass production and elements. But that basically got me to think, if I were to change in material, this is the catalog of the architectural victims uh, of the explosion, one of many, but this is the warehouse uh, that Bebu should big have. And uh, that's where I thought I'd propose. Um, the proposed strategy adopts an indirect approach in tackling the project. It investigates the potential of using paper as a recording material in order to create subtle interventions to Beirut's 19th century home. The home therefore becomes a kind of palimpsest, an archival case bearing visible traces of, the, of its earlier form rather than remaining a, re a mere historical representation. So now um, there are things made to look new and old things made to look old. And also there is also what already is. So what we're currently in right now. So I'm just gonna take you through the process of production. This is basically what I um, first did. Um, I started casting uh, one of uh, like a completely broken door uh, standing on one leg uh, 
doing some experiments because obviously with the material change, you have properties that change. So in this case, uh, the transparency, that could be something I could play with later uh, to highlight maybe some different areas of, uh, of the item uh, that are, is completely broken. So this is just a test in the workshop. Some details that capture uh, quite vividly the what's remaining um, of the on the on the doors. So you have the lock that is completely broken. You have the dust that is uh, that that is still on the surface of the door, and you have some paint more as like the some leftovers of the paint that uh, that the, the paper also captures. Another one of of the details, and. Um, I would like to end with this image just to say that at the moment they look like sculptural pieces, uh, which they can be, but at the same time, uh, I've been going on the ground since after the explosion and uh, recently so, and I've been working in this house where I'm surrounded by builders. And as I said earlier, I've actually made this house kind of a workshop for myself. And at the same time, since I'm kind of registering what the story, which is the, a collective story, I would like to um, go forward with this project by engaging people somehow in the authorship of uh, the development of these objects. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, so thank you, Haya. Okay, so this is her fourth year project. We hope to see how it turns out in the end of the year exhibition. Um, next, we have um, Frederick Weissenborn who uh, has received his doctorate from the Bartlett School of Architecture. Um, and his work explores the relationship between built form and urban social justice. And so Frederick was uh, in Beirut during the 2019 protests and maintains close relationships with people involved in the movement. Uh, and yeah, we spoke on the phone and he has this kind of impressive knowledge of the situation. So Frederick will give us a bit of uh, context. Yeah, sure. Because the kind of topic of reconstruction is something I think the Lebanese architectural community is very familiar with. Sure. Uh, so right now, he will kind of tell us what these conversations have been about. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so Thank you, Frederick. I'll, yeah. I'll get started now, if that's all right, Riyad. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, as Riyad was... Uh, saying my name is Frederick Weisenborn. I'm incredibly pleased to be uh, here with you today um, in the esteemed company of uh, my fellow speakers and at a symposium which is incredibly important and timely. My talk today is a much condensed version of a three-hour seminar that I gave earlier this year here at the AA. It takes as its point of departure the regeneration of downtown Beirut after the Civil War, but has as its main subject of investigation the site-specific artwork located in a derelict structure in downtown, which was launched at the end of 2020. In the talk, I'll provide a bit of context about downtown um, before discussing in more detail uh, the artwork in question and the strategies that it deploys. As you will see, my talk addresses the ideas of memory and hopefulness, um, two of the concepts that this part of the symposium um, is structured around, although I'll use rather different, but um, I'll argue related terms, namely those of repression and spectrality. Like other parts of Beirut, downtown was uh, severely affected by the Lebanese civil war. This picture is of uh, Martyrs Square, and it shows the considerable destruction sustained by the built environment during the conflict. After the war, reconstruction of the area was considered um, an urgent task for a variety of reasons, not least to promote reconciliation between communities after years of sectarian violence. The task to lead the redevelopment of the area fell in 1994 to a company called Solidaire, which most of you will know, uh, and which I won't discuss in any real detail today. 
Apart from to say that the company, which was set up by Rafiq Hariri, the then prime minister, and which today has the highest market valuation of any company in Lebanon by some margin, operates in a rather opaque way with large parts of its land holdings coming from compulsory purchase orders, the legality of which many have argued to be dubious. The regenerated downtown that exists today, some 27 years after Solidaire was set up, is a far cry from the area known to Beirutis prior to the war. It's structured around exclusive shops offering luxury goods and is home to high-end residential blocks and hotels, offers which mainly are aimed at tourists from the nearby Gulf countries, although their numbers have dwindled since the onset of the war in Syria, and wealthy members of the Lebanese diaspora. Regeneration has given the neighborhood a rather sanitized and manicured appearance. This picture is from the Beirut soups, which you might say look more like a dreary Western shopping center than a traditional bazaar or souk. The focus on exclusive shops and the many high-end properties, which are often completely vacant or only in use for parts of the year, contribute to a sense of estrangement and alienation. The contrast with the hustle and bustle of pre-war downtown is said by those who know the area to be stark. According to Georges Korn, a former finance minister, the area used to be a place where all of the social classes would mix. It was the biggest symbol of coexistence in Lebanon. Now he says, it's a kind of no man's land for rich people. While in many ways tragic, perhaps this outcome is not coincidental or driven purely by commercial interests. Scholars like the Danish historian Suna Haugsbühler have argued that the Lebanese state has entered the country into a state-sponsored form of cultural amnesia, which in effect glosses over the history of intersectarian violence, promoting instead um, consumption as an anodyne and indirect uh, form of co uh, post-conflict reconciliation. Retail therapy for a country that never, never had an official truth and reconciliation commission. This essentially social critique has been extended to the reconstruction of downtown by both Lebanese and non-Lebanese academics. Hadi Makarem, a Lebanese scholar, argues that the area has been, quote, stripped of its history and that Solidaire has reconstructed a past that can be described as fake and depoliticized, one that in an important sense is based on an ethos of consumerism and commercialism. The deliberate memory loss, which is suggested by these scholars, indicates that the word amnesia is perhaps not quite right. More accurately, what we are dealing with is a form of active forgetting, a social spatial manifestation of what psychoanalysts would call repression. And that is the active exclusion of certain sentiments and emotions which are deemed corrosive and contradictory to the hegemonic symbolic structure that preserves a certain identity or ego, or in this case, a society still grappling with the shock of civil war. And so it's against this background of repression and amnesia, both cultural and spatial, that the artwork that I'll now discuss must be understood. The work in question is a site-specific installation, a video set in the Grand Théâtre, which is located in downtown and which was operational as a place of culture from 1929 till 1975, that is, till the Civil War set in. Like most of downtown, the building is now technically the property of Solidaire, who, true to form, 
has plans to turn it into a boutique hotel. In 2020, a group of artists led by directors Aya Atui and Anthony Sayun reclaimed the theater to stage a cultural event. The event, a multimedia performance of the last aria of Wagner's opera Tristan und Isolde, was meant to have been open to all Beirutis, something which unfortunately was made impossible by the tragic port explosion, which made the structure of the building unsafe for viewers. Instead, an ethereal film was produced and shared online on nowness.com, a leading digital platform for art and culture. The film shows a singer projected onto a billowing sheet, the sheet itself animated by fans, who sings the final aria, Liebestod, from the opera. According to the directors, the work, which they refer to as a ghost opera, is an attempt to bring out forgotten aspects of Beirut's past, moving beyond the established history, such, such as it is presented and reproduced through spatial structures and everyday behavior. In a statement released at the time of the, of the launch, they said, quote, space has a way of unraveling secrets and Lebanon has its fair share. The gaps in cultural history make it impossible to ascertain what Lebanon would have been, would have been like if it hadn't been war-torn, end of quote. Here it's necessary that we briefly reflect on the characterization of the artwork as a ghost opera. What does this mean? Why this particular term? We notice, of course, that the association with the phantasmagorical is underscored and reinforced by the singer's spectral projection onto the billowing sheet and by the name of the chosen aria, Liebestod, Love of Death. The fact that the directors of the opera have chosen a work by Richard Wagner also seems significant. Wagner's music is often described as one of corruption, transgression, and disorientation. The characteristics, you might say, of the spectral experience. And of his works, Tristan is considered by many as the most extreme, an opera associated with the loss of self-control, analogous to the experience of the two lovers from whom the opera takes its name. As an artwork, Tristan has been argued to fundamentally alter the consciousness of listeners turning them crazy through the sheer force of its expressivity. This is music as possession, as enchantment, as drug. Writing to the conductor Hans von Bülow in 1854, Wagner says that the aim of his music is that the listener should, quote, yield unresistingly to an ingratiating allurement and thus involuntarily assimilate even what is most alien to their nature. So what is it that we are to assimilate here? What is the alluring, alienating drug offered by this ghostly performance? I believe it is best understood as a probing attempt to break out from the constraints of an all-encompassing ideological framework a framework grounded in repression. Understood as such, the opera represents a unique strategy, a spectral strategy, we might say, for moving beyond repression, a strategy for grounding a new truth. Shimmering strangely in the hazy air of cultural amnesia, this phantasmagorical work speaks of opportunities lost Given the historical context, that is, of course, inevitable. 
but it also conjures up alternative realities, new worlds which lie beyond the confines of a particular symbolic structure, new truths yet to be affirmed. It is a projective cast beyond a certain epistemological horizon towards something which lies beyond the established hegemonic order and which therefore has more to do with what we might call a pure event or to use a term from Lacanian analysis, the real. That is something which lies beyond the imaginary and beyond the symbolic, a state somehow outside of language yet fully expressive. We're here reminded of the so-called spectral archives produced by the Lebanese artist Walid Rad under the moniker of the Atlas Group, a collection of artifacts from real events that had taken place during the war, but recounted by people that had been invented for an organization that did not really exist at least not in the way that it was being presented. We understand that these works refer back to traumas. They are, in a sense, symptomatologies of traumatic events. But their spectral aspect points beyond that. What characterizes the spectral as strategy is an ability to not just diagnose, but scramble a discourse through the development of a ciphered clandestine language. This strange language creates a sucha in the symbolic realm and shapes a space in which a new tentative truth can emerge. Characterized by its singularity, this truth falls outside of the existing categories of the symbolic. Like the idea of dirt under Socrates's nail or the sandal mark on the savior's feet, it implies something which is contradictory to our established frameworks of understanding and which we cannot therefore comprehend. And so while we might take the site-specific nature of our ghost opera as an indication that it is just about space and in a sense about just space, the true scope of the opera seems to lie beyond the built environment, taking on the more thorny issue of post-conflict reconciliation. As Beirutis rebuild their city once more following the port explosion in 2020, and in the aftermath of the recent assassination of Lokman Slim, another archivist, they must consider the balance they strike between amnesia and nostalgia remembering and rebuilding. But as they do, they should also consider the alternative pathways offered up by these spectral manifestations. As the doomed lovers of Tristan know, sometimes the only path forward is the leap into delirium. Or to quote Jacques Ancière, sometimes the real must be fictionalized in order to be thought. Right, so I think I'll conclude my talk here. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, Riyadh for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and uh, also I wanted to thank the students on uh, Unit 12 at the AA um, who I've had the pleasure to develop these ideas together with. So a big shout out to them. And finally, a shout out to my parents who are <laughs> calling in from Copenhagen. So hi, Morfa. Um, and that's it. I'll conclude here. Thanks. Thank you, Frederick. <clears throat> Such a nice uh, presentation. Um, How do I unshare? Do I need to X out? I think you should just put your mouth, uh, your mouse uh, <laughs> uh, at the top of the screen and then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah. All right, so um, next up is Umeya, Umeya Malaib, who is the founding architect of OMOA, or O-M-O-O-A. How should we pronounce it, Umeya? <laughs> uh, as you like. 
I like Omoa. Omoa is great. Uh, yeah. Go for it. <laughs> uh, an architecture and design practice. This is based in Beirut. Um, Maya teaches part time at the Lebanese American University. So, Maya, you have the floor. If you want to share Thank your you. screen. All right. All right, so first of all, I want to thank you, Riyad, for putting this together and uh, the AA for um, hosting this symposium. It's been uh, amazing so far and I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, I'm going to be uh, giving a short presentation about heritage buildings that have been inherited throughout generations and that now exist in a vacant a uh, state of uh, impotence, of decay. And I will recount the story of a particular building to illustrate this. So in the late 19th century, Brahim Yosef Salman traveled by boat to Argentina and made a short fortune as a merchant. He came back to Lebanon in the early 1920s and wanted to invest in real estate in Beirut. At first, he was offered large pieces of empty land in Ras Beirut, uh, but was advised against it by friends who told him, do you really want to buy land among cactus and coyotes? So instead, in Stras Beirut, for those who are not familiar, uh, instead he partnered up with a friend of his, Abdel Qadir Al Qadiri, and he uh, bought a building in Bashura. It's a four floor sandstone building that is two minutes away from the Bashura cemetery. And it exists over here on the map. So okay. Salman slide, and slide. This, you can't hear me. I'm sorry. Is everything? Can you guys see the slides and can you guys hear me? We can hear you, but we're just seeing the PDF as normal view, not full screen. So we just see the reconstructing Beirut page. Now we can, yeah, I think you can just slide next here. Now we're seeing slides. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe so usually it works when you share your desktop screen instead of yeah. the window. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Okay. So, uh, what did you guys last see? I think you need to show us everything. We only saw the presentation page. Okay. So uh, this is uh, Salman, Rahim Yusuf Salman. He wanted to buy land in Beirut. Uh, this is Ras Beirut. This is a map from 1912. You can see that there was nothing built there yet. Uh, the American University of Beirut had started to have some, uh, some buildings. This is Beshura. It's very close to the center, the city center. It was a vibrant neighborhood. And that's why he and his partner, um, Abdel Qadir Al Qadiri, uh, decided to buy a building there. This building was existing. It was built in the 1880s. Um, and it is located here. I hope you can see now. This is a map of Bashura from Google Earth that is from now, 2021. You can see the cemetery that has been there for over 100 years and the building is just two minute, a two minute walk from there. All right, so Salman returned to Ramli, his hometown in the mountains, and he also bought lots of land, became a Khawaja, got married and had four daughters. And he and his wife passed away in the 40s. We jump two generations later. Adel Nur din his eldest uh, uh, grandson, is a lawyer and someone who also uh, lived in one of the apartments of the building in Beshura uh, during the late 70s and early 80s. It was the height of the civil war or one of the heights of the civil war and Beshura was a very dangerous place to live. Adel recalls often that sometimes the fighting would be so intense um, on his street that he couldn't reach uh, his building, he couldn't reach um, his home. So he would spend, often spend nights in, hotel, in a hotel um, because the fighting would be terrible. And so in the end, in the mid eighties, he and his sisters moved out of the building and, um, and many tenants did the same. They followed suit, they moved out. And so by the 
by the late 90s, the building became completely vacant um, as all the tenants had either left or had passed away by then. And after the war, Beshura had fallen into poverty and crime, and squatters occupied the building for a short while. And then looters came, and they started to strip the building of the bathroom fixtures, the kitchen fixtures. They stole the copper wire from the copper from electric wires, and um, and even they even stole the the colored glass from the arches, and they tried to steal the floor tiles, the colorful floor tiles. So. So not only had the building become vacant, but it had also become uninhabitable. So going back to the Salman family, uh, of the four daughters of Salman, Bahia and Munira passed away young, but Najla and Shahla lived a long life and Najla was the last to pass in June of 2016. It was then that Adil uh, decided to gather the paperwork needed for the inheritance to pass on the inheritance to be able to distribute the shares because at this point it's still under the name of his grandfather so and also at this point the the number of inheritors from the side of yusuf salman of ibrahim yusuf salman had reached 14 inheritors on the other side of the family of uh, abdul qadir's family uh, he also had uh, 12 to 13 uh, inheritors. And so this building now uh, belonged to almost 30 people. In Lebanon, we are governed by different uh, types of inheritance laws. So for non-Muhammadi religions, so meaning the Christians and the Jews, they are subject to a civil inheritance law. Whereas the Muhammadi religions, such as uh, Sunnah, Shia, Druze, Alawite, etc., they each have their own uh, set of inheritance laws. And Salman uh, um, was of the Druze sect and Al-Qadiri was of the Sunni sect. So each uh, family was distributing shares um, from two different um, sets of inheritance laws. Adil was occupied with the paperwork of just the Salman side of the family. And after a couple of years, uh, after uh, running around after cousins who lived abroad and who lived here, he managed to get power of attorney from all of his cousins to be able to move forward and do the paperwork of the inheritance. However, he had another problem. He didn't have the death certificate of his grandmother, Rashida Salman, who um, owned 400 shares of the building. So in order for him to pass on her, her, her shares, he needed a death certificate. So to get that, he had to go to a judge so that she can declare that Rashida Salman is no longer living, knowing that if she were living, she would be over 120 years old. Anyway, this paper is still stuck with the judge, and this is just on the Salman side of the family of all the complications, not to mention the complications of the others of the Qadiri side of the family. In parallel with this, this building um, was put under the uh, among the buildings deemed of heritage value in the 70s um, by Absad and therefore became a protected building. And the protection that the heritage law grants only goes so far as to prevent the building from being demolished. Under the Lebanese law, any repairs of any building fall under the responsibility of the owner, uh, whether the building is old or new. And this building is made of sandstone. The structure consists of steel beams supported by the sandstone walls, and so it would really not be a standard renovation. It's, it's uh, I mean, it would be an expensive building. And so the building in Beshura became stuck in the state of, it, it became frozen in a state of limbo and in a state of continuous decay. Um, on one hand, inheritance laws were making it untouchable because the building is conceived as a distribution of shares rather than a clear division of space. Um, or division of, of apartments. So even if one of the inheritors could afford the renovation of one apartment, it is impossible to, to define which apartment he or she would get. And buying out other inheritors is close to impossible since the real estate value of the land greatly surpasses that of the building to the point where it becomes ridiculous to pay such high prices for a building that needs a great deal of renovation. On the other hand, the heritage laws prevent the building's demolition and so render it unprofitable for anyone wanting to buy it at these disproportionately high prices. Furthermore, the law does not extend any aid to help with the renovation and maintenance 
of the buildings that it aims to protect. And so this building has been in a state of decay that has rendered it impotent for years. And to the inheritors, there is no, no foreseeable way out other than for them to demolish the building to have agency over their own inheritance. On the 4th of August, the port of Beirut explosion caused colossal damage to the city. And on the 12th of, on 12th of November, Adil received a letter from the Qadiri family stating that the stairs in the building of Bashura uh, had collapsed and they were greatly damaged and they were planning on applying for demolition. And they're currently following up on this. Adil, of course, gave uh, his blessing because uh, selling, demolishing would um, answer a lot of their, their problems. But seeing the building, there are only two steps that have, been, that have fallen. Um, and Adil is doubtful that it would be granted this permission. The building has been a witness to the depression in Lebanon in uh, 1918. It has been a, a witness to two world wars, a brutal 15 year civil war, squatters, looters, and the neglect of time. And the Beirut blast is just another episode in its stubborn life. So I just wanna conclude by saying, this building is personal to me as uh, Ibrahim Salman is actually my great grandfather. And this building has been a sleeping project um, for, for years uh, in my mind. And the explosion really helped us see the, the decay and destruction of Beirut but it doesn't mean that it wasn't there before the explosion. The, it, the destruction was always there. This building looks like this even before the, the Beirut blast happened. And having experienced the blast personally, it reawakened the urgency of thinking about this building and about what we are rebuilding and who we are rebuilding for. It is a conversation about land ownership, about transmission and heritage and identity, a conversation that is very much about our future and that should not ignore the ongoing and systemic decay of the entire city pre and post disaster. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. Very nice presentation. It's nice to see that uh, you're, a, you're an heir to a heritage house and, and that uh, you've actually done your research about this. And that uh, it's, uh, I'm an heir that cannot touch my yeah. my uh, my inheritance. Yeah, it's quite. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, thank so you. thank you very much. Um, now we have uh, Od who will be sharing your screen. Uh, hi, Od. <laughs> hi. <laughs> so Od uh, studied architecture at Alba in Beirut and Columbia University in New York before moving to London to join Stiff and Trevelyan Architects in 2019. She was the program coordinator of GSAP's New York Paris program. Ode has taught at Pratt Institute and Columbia University. Uh, following the Beirut blast, she co-founded the GSAP Collective for Beirut with Rula, who will be speaking later. Um, and she is a member of the Arab Center for Architecture and, and the Architecture Club in London. So, Thank you, Riyadh. Yeah. Let me share my screen. Um, Can you see it in full screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Omaya, for that presentation. It's very beautiful. And thank you to the AA for putting together this symposium. I think it's uh, very important to address these issues. Um, I'm going to try to be brief in my presentation. So when I talk to my parents, there are a lot of used to be. This used to be this, this used to be that. And when I look at Beirut today, these places no longer exist. Most of the buildings were demolished after the war, while others shattered have lain empty for years, waiting for the next building boom to reach them. Consequently, public squares face the same outcome. Over the past 50 years, Lebanon has seen massive changes in public space and in the urban fabric. What had been a popular historic and cultural space filled with local merchants and street vendors was morphed into a high-end commercial center with luxury brands that only an elite minority can afford. 
Even in areas where public space is properly designed, it's unfortunately a ghost town due to skyrocketing real estate prices. As for the new development in the city, they seem to rise as standalone elements, disregarding accessible public amenities and prioritizing valet parking over pedestrian routes. With very little adequate public re recreational areas, alleyways and streets take the role of essential public spaces. They become areas of gathering and leisure. In fact, in a study done by the Beirut Urban Lab, they found that residents consistently mention street corners as spaces for social gathering. Balconies start to act as extension of the public space. Whether it's to watch people passing by or chit chat with neighbors, balconies are predominantly popular with older people seeking interaction with local residents. Unfortunately, following the blast, these spaces were either damaged or overtaken by scaffolding. The blast drew, in fact, a lot of attention to vacant lots and abandoned buildings across the city, fearing that the neglect following the civil war would happen again. An inspiring example is the work of Nation Station, which overtook an abandoned gas station with very little additions like strings to hang clothes and tensile fabric, they managed to offer support to the community following the blast. Heritage building also drew a lot of attention after the explosion. And even though preserving these buildings is of the utmost importance, we should be looking at more mundane buildings as George Arbid would call them B-series buildings that make 80% of the city. And when we think of B-series buildings, we think of B-series public space. Now is the time to address ways in which we can reactivate these spaces. How can we preserve these streets and alleyways? In order to activate these interstitial spaces, art can be a method to recontextualize historical memory, to help us see and experience heritage in a new way. It has a direct engagement with the pedestrian. A good example of this work is the, is the work of Nada Sahnawi, um, where she appealed to the public to participate in the making of the installation by publishing the following question in the press and on the internet in 2003. Do you have a memory of daily life in downtown Beirut before the start of the war in 1975? If you wish to share this memory with the public, please write a text recalling this memory. Another good example is the work the work of Ieva saudar Gaite, where she uses calcate to draw a line across the entire terrain of Rauche, which is one of the last remaining natural zones free of construction. Sorry, uh, these types of installations should also take place on stairs, sidewalks and balconies in order to raise awareness and reactivate these spaces. What would it take for us to stop and actually look at the art directing us and reflect on how this may affect us? I believe that the moment of search, for, of search all over the city looking for that piece of art or that installation would allow us to go around town with an open eye. These are the areas we are trying to preserve. Why? Because emotional attachment to a place is at the core of why preservation came to be in the first place. We preserve these places because we need them, and we need them in order to address Lebanon's complex history. Art intervention could help regenerate the neighborhood, but, but also reclaim abandoned spaces for public usage in the course of reconstruction. The recent economic crisis would only make these spaces more and more essential with people no longer able to afford to go to malls and restaurants. Unfortunately, history condemns us to keep telling the same stories to our children, the story of what used to be there. I would like to end by hoping that one day we will, able, we will be able to break the cycle. Thank you. Thank you, Aude. Thank you, Aude, for, uh, for this presentation. Uh, it's true public space has become more essential than ever now with uh, with going out being very difficult now not only in the context of the pandemic but in the context of, of the economic situation um, next up is uh, Rula Saramoun who was my ex-boss <laughs> so uh, Rula Saramoun is an architect and designer found, founder of a Beirut-based multidisciplinary practice engaging 
material and experiential explorations through multi-scalar projects. Uh, she is a co-founder of the GSAP Collective for Beirut, also with Aud, um, that was launched in 2020 to address the city's multiple crises. Uh, her work has been exhibited in Beirut, Venice, and New York, and published in prominent magazines such as Domus, Wallpaper, and Galerie. Uh, Rula holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the American University of Beirut and a Master's of Science in Advanced Architectural Design from Columbia University. Rula, you can go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, Riyad, and uh, for the introduction and the <laughs> curation of the event. I'll uh, share my screen. And here we go. We can see the full screen. Okay, great. So thank you for uh, creating the space to discuss Beirut after the blast today. Uh, today marks the seventh, seventh month after the blast with uh, no answer. Um, I'll be uh, presenting an ongoing research today. Um, Beirut After the Apocalypse is an, is an obsessive introspection. It is a collection, juxtaposition, and analysis of images, numbers, of, and data acting as a therapeutic and cathartic process in a state without accountability it explores the state of architecture in a city in constant crisis. As economies and technology developed, advances in the construction field and the engineering of materials have altered the way we live. We started using more complex systems of enclosure, giving our shelters lightness and transparency that intelligently disguise mechanisms of protection and control. Adhering to mechanisms of surveillance has given us the illusion that they are the key, the, digi the digital trail that will allow us to find truth in times of uncertainty. However, on August 4th, 2020, a double explosion took place at Beirut's port, devastating the city and resetting all norms of what we know as safety and security. The damage of the August 4th double explosion are way beyond the, the destruction that Beirut has ever experienced, and it happened in a split second. This event reminded us once again that the city we love and live in is, in constant, is, 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 is constantly violated and subjected to aggressions, tarnishing our memories and our image of what the city could be. It is not the first time that Beirut is subject to wars, but it is mostly not the first time that Beirut is subject to blasts and acts of terrorism. And despite the fact that what happened on August 4th, uh, 2020 is not comparable, we are compelled to go back and think and remember some of the events that have happened previously. While what happened on August 4th is not comparable, it also leads us to question more than ever the security measures that we have been subjected to over the years and which have equally encroached on our, on our privacy and our public spaces. Spaces which were supposed to be uh, open and booming and vibrant of life were closed off to protect state institutions. We'll be seeing three images of the Serai that were taken at different times and that reflect in a very direct way, the gradual and deepening civic distrust that has happened over the years. All this introspection kind of went, uh, um, made us want to go back and look at all these events and map them. We started out by mapping um, blasts that were used as tools for political assassinations, starting by mapping their locations and then adding the additional information, uh, these events were mapped in red. We also indicated the exact location, the time, the, the target, and we also estimated the amount of explosive use based on the articles that we found in our research. These were represented at a scale of one meter 
uh, to one kilogram or one drawing unit to one kilogram. We went through the same process by, when mapping to uh, BLAST as tool for terror. And then overlapped all the information to find ourselves overwhelmed with the amount of events that's without counting all the wars and um, all the other events that we may have uh, overseen. However, the Beirut blast is not comparable. If we were to map it in the same exact way and we were to represent um, the equivalent of the 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, uh, it would be equivalent to 1,000 to 1,500 tons of explosive. And this would be the scale of the city if we were to represent it at the same uh, drawing scale. This obsessive um, digging into information and data and dates made us also want to go back and map um, these explosions on a chart where we would look at years and months uh, in the past 15 years and using gradients of red and blue or violet, depending on what your screen will, will show you, we started overlaying uh, the different events that have happened and started to kind of understand or at least look at the trends of events that have happened, the frequency. Um, and you can start to see odd uh, occurrences such as June being a very busy month um, and so on. Further looking obsessively into data, we looked at the hours of uh, these explosions and mapped them on a dial of 24 hours, um, representing again the political assassinations in red and uh, acts of terror in blue and started to also like read a sort of, of pattern in the hours of these events happening. Using the, 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 the information we gathered online regarding the status, uh, we tried to dig into the, each event and only to draw that most investigations were open-ended or inconclusive. However, what happened on August 4th is much different as it was an attack to people's homes and people who were in their safe zone suddenly found themselves without no, with, with nothing, looking uh, at just a few images as we've seen a lot already. So the question I would like to ask, and I mean, as it's already been said, it's a work in progress and we're developing that research and we're happy to, to continue that conversation later. How do you reinstate trust when people were attacked in their safe zone what is the agency of architects and architecture in doing so? And what are the elements we can look at to do so? Are there typological or uh, typological um, uh, elements we can look at? Or is it also looking at uh, elements of construction, elements of systems of enclosure that will help us to do so? Thank you. Thank you, Lula. It's a, it's a very nice presentation. It's a thought actually that I think, you know, many of us have been having, you know, is it time to, to accept violence as part of, of our context, as part of the environment, as, as other environmental factors, such as sunlight and, uh, and the wind direction, you know, maybe we should start considering violence as being one of them in the way we build today. I mean, of course, this is not something we would <clears throat> want to accept, yeah. but I think that it is a reality in, in many cities that have lived through many conflicts. And um, I mean, it is just food for thought and it's also yeah. a bit speculative. So it's not uh, necessarily yeah. a research that's very uh, conclusive. Yeah. Thank you, Rula. Thank you. Uh, so next is Samir Aid. Uh, who was born in Beirut in 1977, 
Samir Al-Yarid studied for his uh, DS in architecture at the Academy, uh, Academy Libanese de Beaux Arts, so Alba. Uh, and he graduated in 2001. He got the Shadeji award winning project. And he's been an architect since 2002. Samarid established his own professional practice, search slash Samarid Architect, entered several competitions and collected numerous prizes, developing a growing reputation with a large set of atypical projects. Search architectural hybrids have been profusely published in the 2008 World Architecture Community Awards. He's an instructor since 2005. Samarid is the founder and director of the Alba Experimental Platform, through which he has been actively exploring the cybernetic affiliation between natural systems, emergent forms, artificial intelligence, and spatial linguist linguistics. He published Epitome 10 plus Specimen 0 in 2010, Specimen 1 in 2011, Amalgam in 2013, Insectiles and Mortuary, a architecture pamphlet in 2014, and Metaportals, an ongoing speculative research. Uh, so it's basically the the Alba's DRL, which we haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we can... Probe the body of Mayhem Post 0408, 2020, like a pathologist, as a means to awaken a digital renaissance. This immersive corpus of work aims to act simultaneously as experimental tool and instigational trailer for leads to examine thoroughly the post-apocalyptic anatomies of Beirut's blast scenery. Mapping on the archaeological signifiers of hijacked territories, typological artifacts mechanistic gizmos ghostly structures, oblivious voids and remote memories, it instills an exhaustive taxonomy of waste, explicitly transgressing analog ruination to digital speculative worlds. Body of Mayhem vindicates the emergence of an alternate techno-dump province, while engaging spatial fiction as political hammer. We are collectors of debris, filthy, immoral, transitory. We are expired forces, salvaged relics, re-encrypted. We are predatory scavengers, feeding on fecal carcasses, exquisite cadavers, domestic wreckage and amorphous rubble. We are creatures of the unwanted, a dismantled mid-eastern postmodern collective, looking straight into the corrupt soul of annihilation. We are living witnesses of a monumental murder. Can you hear the battering sounds incantation of a thousand ton sledgehammer, ruthlessly pounding the silent icon of their unconscious minds, grinding it down to the ground? Silos of salvation, silos of damnation, under implacable assault. Apparatus titrative arrest with an irrepressible appetite for destruction triggers an iconoclastic lobotomization of the governing status quo. We are collaborative mashups of traditional 19th century triple arch bourgeois house, ochre stone facades, banal concrete building slabs and walls, haphazard blue textile blob and exoskeletal wires, tectonically meshing all together into neo-vernacular ammo. Our communal phenotype extends into infra-thickness crust, self-transferring towards a deep trench space guerrilla. We are disemboweled bellies of exploded hangars and industrial warehouses. Our stochastic lacework draws spatial calligraphies and autopoietic choreographies. Inverted circuits of serpentine lines and rotten ribs plunge through physiological serum. In Utero. We are the reminiscent textures of a psycho-atmospheric milieu. We are introspective visions vacillating between polyphonic daydream vertigo and lucid nightmare inferno. We are object and subject, effect and effect in synesthetic coexistence, a polyptic condenser of acoustic signatures, distorted landscapes, abysmal melodies, entirely deciphered into eschatological prophecies. We are an eric momentum. Inward memento. 
we are necroecologies, ingrained chains of biotope modifiers in situ. We are infinitesimal Staphylococcus automata cultivated on dilapidated granaries. In vivo, we are crawling hordes of detrites feeders, stimulating hungry colonies of detrites eaters. We are mongrels of concrete and machine in symbiotic spatio-temporal autopsy. Robotic mecha brackets in surgical fornication, incubating the seeds of a spectacular mesona beam, from a repository of defect to perfect organism. We are a turbulent swarm of animated pigments, in astral routing, a nascent shrapnel nebula, in existential maelstrom, agitated matter coalescing into astronomical flesh, anthropotechnological resources trapped in psychogeological rumination. We are a digested sludge of solid junk baked into macroscopic top of vestige. We are a stellar vessel gone a rogue, swallowed inside a sinking black hole. A metabolic exodus, terraforming in limbo. We are a desecrated effigy, crude, indecent, undraped to the bone. Leaf, a post-traumatic grief remodeled in molded relief. We are cranial cavities of infected skulls, copulating with vacuous spirits in profanation. We are fossilized altar, avatar of the veiled, carnal sanctuary of the sublime obscene. We are a troglodytic chimera with cannibalistic tendencies, the supreme masochistic mausoleum of a converted libidinal breed. We are urban excrements, resilient yet evolutionary dislodgements, unfamiliar species yet characterized with ubiquitous endemism, estranged yet enchanting bits and pieces indices, queer genitalia, incrementally endowed with configurational propensities, airborne compilation with super additives, bonding agents and intricacies, we are imaginary districts of built heresy, we are emergency specimens in full modus operandi, amidst catatonic urge. We are error segments in sequential combination, iterative pop-up fragments in extensive cumulation, mix and merge compounds of cartographical variation. Featuring a wide-ranging repertoire of obsolete residues along with an inclusive panoply of trivial leftovers, we adopt l gangers between shells and shelters, temporary structures destined for the precipitate appropriation of the homeless many. We are prosthetic bodies, in metastatic secretion, swelling ganglions with buoyant properties. We are hybrids of emergent limbs and machinic gear. Our modernist electricity duly barn block host is of no competence but only instrumental for parasitic proliferation. Spatial intercourse, virulent three-dimensional growth, malignant leaking in power relation. Can you feel the intrinsic electromagnetic discharge of deprivation? We are a penitentiary protocol of a pernicious nature, a purgatorial installation of an extroverted panopticon rifted amidst the core of a collapsing dedication from the Marmigale people to their obnoxious warlords and abusive confessional leaders. We are Marmayhem, a land-caged agglomeration for the public servants, served back as zoophilic immunity for civic retribution. We are memorial urns, perpetually revisited, ephemeral chunks of physical remembrance, digi-compressed ancestral construct, via cryptic said. Driven nuggets, a metempsych. We are plundered tissues, stylistic singularities, pondered, hiding digital ruins in disguise, fermenting on a patrimonial trans heritage compost, turning. We are a pseudo-therapeutic troupe of drama prestidigitators, acrobatic simulators.
Puppets and extra agitators, a freaky bunch of puppet masters, hysterical jugglers, amnesic buffoons with lethal abilities. We are horror show hostility spilled in distress cues and polychromatic hues. We are a cargo port facility ludicrously commuted into a crime park attraction. Welcome to our circus spiritus. We are disruptive point cloud emanations, spasmodic ethereal pumps, in aerial defecation, invasive soft tissue, catering for environmental fabrication. We are insurgent vesicles soaked in convulsive latitudinal fluctuation. We are warm cocoons in bloom. We are the fallen monstrosity condition. On the verge of mutational reboot, we are visible glitch constrictions in the thick of shadow pockets within a protozoa wound. We are a self-generative progenitor, hatching simulacrum, excrescent malformation beyond anomaly or aberration. We are subliminal ontology of the grotesque, suicidal abortion versus other genocidal inclinations. We are a cathedralesque pipe organ, in cacophonous dissonance. We are obliterated cascarades, enduring profuse stock miscarriage. Our chest now stands ripped open. We are a cyclopean rampart, barrel mural stuck in scrambled channels. We are zombified bulwark, exorcised, tranquilized, fertilized. Our intimate occupancies sanctified as entropic asylum for fugitive vagrants. We are littering clusters of raw scrap metal components, augmented in technoid slump conglomerations. We are anti-gravitational water thames, loaded with navigational drones. A sky dance. We are a cathartic tribute to the deceased architect, a cybernetic elegy. As much synthetic embodiment as syncretic adornment, morphogenetically derived from a plethora of sacred figures. We permissively grafted a posthumous shrine upon your earthly residence, in a metaphysical summoning attempt. A joint transcendental after-death experience. Rest in peace, John Mark Bonfils. Thank you so much, Samir. Always a pleasure to see uh, what your studio produces. Can you hear me right now? Yeah, actually, it's much better than before. Finally. <laughs> How did you fix it? No, not really. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah, it's, it's amazing, no? I think in this session we saw a lot of student work, a lot of thought that has been uh, going into uh, what the next steps are. Uh, we saw uh, a lot of talk about memory. We saw a very informative presentation by Umeya about um, how to deal with inheritance or maybe what is preventing us from dealing with uh, uh, heritage. Um, yeah, you're getting a lot of uh, uh, positive comments on it in the chat. You have a lot of fire. Uh, now we uh, uh, open the, okay, <laughs> now, <laughs> now, we, <laughs> now we open the floor for any questions, if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, if not, I would really like to address, to go through the uh, uh, topic of this uh, session and address it sort of, uh, maybe one by one, no? So let us talk first about uh, nostalgia. And uh, I guess, you know, the role of, of reconstruction uh, in, in 
uh, either uh, activating nostalgia or maybe trying to uh, forget it. You know? uh, this, is, this is what Frederick Stock was about. It was about repression and trying to forget things. Uh, uh, forget things by actually uh, uh, cancelling them in the timeline of a, of a building, if I understand correctly. And I would like to put this into conversation with maybe uh, Umayya, who, who would like to, to, to uh, activate the uh, heritage buildings that she has uh, uh, gotten. And maybe also with Ode, no? who, who also talked about uh, this, this topic. How can, how can maybe uh, all those things work together, trying to open up an abandoned heritage building, uh, kind of, that is left to rot, uh, to the public, no? uh, who owns Le Grand Théâtre, is it Solidaire now? Uh, yeah, so please. Go so ahead. is it maybe useful if I just quickly summarize kind of um, my sort of the main point that I was trying to make yeah. as a way to just get us started. So yeah. I think there's something very interesting going on in downtown and it's something that I've only recently had an opportunity to explore with the students at unit 12. Um, but it's, it's this idea of, of the built environment sort of reinforcing a particular ideology so there's not necessarily anything new in that thought. Lots of people have explored that before. Um, but what I found interesting was then the relationship between the built environment in general and but in downtown in particular, and, and this notion of some kind of willed forgetfulness, a willed amnesia, um, which which calls to mind, and it, you know, I mentioned Lacan, but it's not just Lacan. I mean, you have this notion of the return of the repressed you find in mm -hmm. Freud as well. But what's interesting, I think, about this notion of repression is that whenever there's repression, there's also something that tries to kind of break through. Uh, this is a, sort of a fundamental principle of psychoanalysis. Yeah. Um, but that which kind of filters through not necessarily manifest one-to-one -one as what is being repressed, it sort of changes its shape, right? So this is why when you do psychoanalysis, you try to get people to talk and you try and form associations between the words that they express. So you're not sort of ha necessarily hanging on to one word and sort of saying, well, all right, he mentions or she mentions one word, that's mm -hmm. what it's all about. You try and understand where that word comes from and how it sort of percolates through from the subconscious into the consciousness. And, and, and in a similar way, you know, we've got this, uh, in fact, a series of artworks. I mean, the one that I discussed is one, but I also mentioned the work of Walid Rad uh, and the Atlas Group, which also have this kind of spectral kind of character. I mean, he uh, calls his artworks spectral archives. So, so there's a way that this kind of repression which you know we've discussed with respect to the civil war it's sort of as it kind of comes through from the general subconsciousness if we go with that if, if we go with that analogy it sort of shape shifts into something um which has a certain kind of manifestation which we then need to work to try to understand what does it mean you know so that's when you start sort of analyzing the works to try to get to some kind of idea. Um, and so there is a very valuable kind of um, type of work which is associated with understanding the buildings that are distributed around in urban space to understand how they're connected by different uh, pathways, to understand their individual histories and the histories um, that they're involved with um, on a sort of neighborhood scale. And so there's kind of, I can see connections with, with quite a few of the other talks that have yeah been given this afternoon but I think there is something very interesting in that and I think um, uh, another word that came up and I'll, I'll end here because I've been going on for too long but another word that came up in addition to amnesia and repression was this idea of truth you know um, and, and I was talking about this kind of libidinal 
triad that Lacan has between the imaginary, the symbolic and the real, the real being something sort of awesome that kind of sort of erupts and, and tears a hole into the uh, identified symbolic structure um, or the symbolic structure that people identify with. And I think that there is kind of a, a you can sort of see how the, the blast in the port could act as, as a kind of the return of the real, if you will, uh, a kind yeah. of a moment where, you know, it's so much beyond the pale that there's no going back. You need to com completely overhaul the framework that you're interpreting events within. Yeah. So, no, I like it a lot. It's, uh, it's kind of like the, the kick in Inception. If, if, if it's a good uh, metaphor, no? waking up from an illusion. Um, I, think, yeah, I think this part of your presentation, speaking of the truth, no? is something that language can never be uh, able to describe. Uh, and and uh, also speaking of uh, for, forgetting consciously and, and uh, willingly uh, building the, the concept of forgetting. Actually, uh, I think I think was very uh, really really uh, spoke to me. No? I think just if I can add, I think it's very relevant to uh, Haya's presentation uh, when she shows uh, the old uh, woman wanting to keep pieces. I mean, this is we already have I think a case study of how it happened in the civil war. You have a lot of buildings that are kept the same which are a constant reminder of what happened. But this doesn't really help us in a way to get out of it. I know that we want to preserve what happened, but sometimes I question and I think that maybe we are enough. Maybe the human body, the Lebanese human body is enough as a memory and we keep the stories going on. And then the architecture can just, be restored, not like it's only there where the actual event that took places were, were, were removed. That's why it, I think it failed. But, but I, in other case studies and other countries, I fear we're, we're, we're the only ones that keep wanting to keep the war on the buildings. I don't see any other examples of countries all over the world where they're keeping this all over the city. It may be one building, like, for example, Beit Beirut, where they kept the building actually as demolished and transformed it into, into a museum, where it works well because it's a museum. That's where you go and experience this type of stuff. But if you, if you take this strategy to all the city and decide to want to preserve what has been destroyed, you just get stuck in a loop. It's a, I think it's a complex um, subject and i'm not sure what's the best approach to it but i feel that looking at the civil war we have a case study in front of us of why not reconstructing and keeping these monuments as as um, bombarded um, places is, is not helping us in a way it's just keeping us stuck in in the past and i think that's why we're not uh, um uh, i I agree with what you're saying in a sense where we should stop looking at things mournfully and longingly and just respectful to our heritage, kind of embrace the future of transformation. But I think uh, uh, in my project, in a way, um, what I was trying to do is maybe, uh, yes, kind of visually kind of take what existed, but then again, by changing its materiality, it's no longer a building. So at the same time, it can... Um, just thinking out loud right now it can turn into a drawing, you know, and that is a way of archiving something, not necessarily making it, um, turning it into the city. So, um, so it was just like my first approach to archiving c cultural heritage in a way. And I think that um, I do agree with you when it comes to like, we don't need an entire city in, in in bullet form for us to remember what happened. Yeah, I, I, my, my, somehow, all mm. but somehow there is that uh, saying that says the medium is the message. So, like, you know, you remember uh, just like um, Alex Cochran was showing us the pictures of, uh, so that's the medium photography, right? So maybe casting is a different medium to show mm. something else. Um, and other mediums, obviously, uh, technological, be it 3D scans or 
other things, you know, like depict an image in a different way. So I think this is where kind of the project was lying. And then obviously I would agree with you that we should kind of embrace the process of trans- the, the future of transformation rather than just... Um, yeah, I think in, in the case of your project, I would almost see the building reconstructed as it was before, but actually have all these elements that you've casted integrated somehow in the house so that you can see what was there and what is now uh, in front of you. Again, I think it's it's a tricky subject and I was just raising this uh, this subject to to invite other people to talk about it. Yeah, I agree. I think our relationship with nostalgia is uh, is one that is uh, something that we're I don't know it's it's, it's love and hate I think in a way um, because uh, when when you when you look at Beirut I had a friend who came he wasn't here during the explosion he lives in the U.S. and he came to Beirut after the explosion and he's looking and he's like you know it looks more like Beirut now how I imagine it in my mind you know everything broken and destructed I mean all the new buildings the glass towers and all of that uh, it didn't feel like Beirut to him so he's used to in his mind Beirut as something. Uh, bullet uh, riddled or broken. I mean, this was like the familiar uh, sort of image of Beirut that uh, that he had. And I found that interesting because um, in a way, we, uh, we maybe are angry with all the new high rises and the towers that are there. Um, but I mean, obviously we don't want to, <laughs> uh, we don't want them to, uh, I mean, it's not like, the explosion is uh, is the answer, but the idea is that um, our image of Beirut is always this wounded bird that we need to to on our preservation. But at the same time, we also need to look forward. We can't keep looking back. We need to um, choose, sort of try to regain our our agency with the city. And there are so many things which is. Part of what I was trying to show in my presentation that we all know this. I mean, I'm not saying anything new and we all want this, uh, but there are so many things in play that prevent this, um, like the legal issues uh, or of whether it's inheritance or whether it's uh, public, uh, private, um, the complications of public and private space or the lack of the public sector over here uh, that prevents us from really actually um, using the city the way we want so that we can stop uh, remembering the past and trying to, uh, you know, uh, keep it as as something that we're holding as something that we, we don't want to let go of. Uh, the Civil War, there was general amnesty for everyone, which means that nothing was resolved, which means that keeping the bullets there is the only way that we can um, remember that it happened because suddenly in what, between a few days, the war is over, everything's fine, and no one's in jail, just like the explosion. So uh, these bullets are like, or these broken buildings are like a way of, um, you know, it's like, you know, it did happen, it did happen. Even if we're pretending it never happened, it did happen. Um, so yeah, that's just, uh, I was thinking of these things when you guys were speaking of the, of the, like, when you're trying to pre- preserve the memory with, with different materials, yeah, the, the memory is so important. But where do we go? I think also when speaking about memory, we have to acknowledge the fact that memory is not objective. No, that memory is actually something that is uh, built with time. No, just like history is not objective and that history's relationship with the past is just... Uh, you know, a very thin uh, connection. Um, and yeah, I think that maybe talking about this this kind of memory that we need to get let go of, or this memory that uh, we will have to soon move uh, on of, you know, move, uh, get over, uh, uh, <clears throat> is actually one that is uh, quite subjective and that is different from uh, one person or another. So the image that your friend has of Beirut might be different than the image than any other person has yes, of Beirut. Yes, of course. This is, but it was, uh, yeah. 
take, um, everyone has their own image of Beirut. Beirut is this enigma that is so much grander in people's imagination. I remember when I was younger, I came by, by car back before the war in Syria. I came by car from Amman with Jordanians who have never been to Beirut and they were waiting to see this, this city, the Beirut that they hear about in stories. And they came and they're like, it's so ugly. It's just a concrete, like, where, where's the beauty in, in Amman? We have houses of stone and blah, blah. So, so really, Beirut is just yeah. so many things in people's imagination. It's true. It's true. But I'm sure that if someday we kind of are able to print memories on translucent paper, and if we superimpose them all, there will be a certain commonality that will be our collective memory. And this is something Amazing. that we need to safe keep. Frederick, you have your hand raised. Yeah, so it was just to say that, um, you know, I think I completely agree with some of the things that were said about the question of kind of remembrance versus kind of moving on. I think that's very critical. And I don't think that there's a black and white answer to that. I think in some cases you want to kind of raise the structures to the ground and, and build something new. And in other cases, you may want to have some kind of recollection. What I will say is that I think that there is some very interesting opportunities that kind of arise in the built environment in Beirut because of the structures that are sort of there, uh, empty structures um, that are sort of left behind by the war. And so when I was in Beirut in 2019, um, so right uh, next to Martin Square, there's this old concrete structure, which is called the egg, I think, in, in common parlance that probably a lot of the people on the call will know. Um, and, and there was this very interesting phenomenon, which was that it became sort of an impromptu site of kind of revolutionary organization. Um, so um, people would congregate there. There would be film screenings. There would be talks. There would be workshops around revolutionary practice. There would be raves. Um, and, and it became sort of a fixed point um, or a fixture for, um, for kind of, well, certainly aspects of the protest movement. And so there's something interesting there as well, which again, sort of, I think it's about adding nuance to this conversation, you know, so to sort of try and really understand the affordances provided by the built environment and the constraints as well. But I think there is something very interesting in, 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 in these structures. And, you know, Contatre sits as well very close to Martyr Square, sits very close to the egg. And these are places that are being reappropriated by people as a form of critique, but also as a form of uh, expression, you know, a new generation that wants to express something, something different. So I think that's something very interesting as well. Yes, yes, it is. The egg has become a kind of vessel, no, a transgenerational uh, uh, vessel. And also, before the protests of 2019, it was, you know, one of the only uh, uh, kind of also. Uh, it stood as a memorial, no. Uh, <laughs> it stood as a, as a memorial to the yeah. war. <laughs> but but it wasn't. I think. Um... A lot of people don't know the, the story behind the egg or the architecture mm. in the modern movement. So I, I think it's just um, we understand it as the way it is. And um, I think that if we were to rebuild it or whatever, it, it would need to have like a proper recognition to the very long list of architects and Lebanese architects that contributed to the mm. modern, to the like, golden era, if you want to call it, in the 60s. Mm. Thank you, Old Lula. You have I your hand raised for a while now. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. I think there's a very strong uh, parallel between, um, on one hand, the civic distrust, the discon on the other hand, the disconnect between uh, citizens and their spaces, the public spaces. And um, on the third hand, with the state's institutions that are not really following you know, any developments. So uh, what Umaya raised in her presentation, which is basically how heritage laws 
and so many other laws, but we will we will stick to this one for the sake of the example, have not developed to accommodate for, you know, uh, passing on. And so we find ourselves where, in a place where the state laws are not following and we're disconnected from our city. Uh, and like, oh, like we have this malaise at every level and like, um, like we need a new social contract. We also need a new civic contract. We need a new contract with our lawmakers. So there are so many elements that need resolve. And uh, I mean, definitely discussing heritage is not a black or white question. So, um, but we have elements in each presentation uh, that have to be t taken into account because they actually uh, represent a very, a very accurate uh, lens of, of the situation we have. Yeah. Samir, where would you say that your student work stands in this conversation? <laughs> I'm not sure you're, you're hearing me. <laughs> so, no, now we are. I was, I, was waiting, I was waiting for my turn <laughs> to enter the, the thing. Uh, yeah. uh, um, yeah, uh, allow me to, to, to start a bit uh, yeah. where uh, the, the, my projection ended, okay, at the same place where uh, the projection ended. It, is, it was of no coincidence that I chose the death of the architect as a closing theme for the whole compendium. On one hand, uh, it is a direct homage to my uh, precious ex alba colleague and friend, architect from my office, uh, who, for the record, was an XAA postgraduate as well. Mm. So uh, it had a, some kind of a symbolic connotation. And on a different note, uh, it was in reference to Roland Barthes' uh, death, death of the author argument. So the architect somehow the sovereignty over his creation in the same way that the author lost control of his own script. This precise statement intercepts the very foundational act of reconstruction. Aren't we here to talk to? of uh, about uh, some kind of a reconstruction. So if I have to put it in a, a more explicit way, uh, do we really need to witness in a post-blast situation the revamping of the East Village building as it previously was in the total absence of its original architect, as if nothing ever happened? By extrapolation, shouldn't we interrogate the absolute sanctity and immutability of all heritage with a big H. So uh, if I go back to uh, your, um, the, 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 the general label, uh, so the hopeful architecture thing and nostalgia, etc. cetera, uh, because the, the, uh, we were a bit debating of it yesterday um, yeah. uh, during our uh, phone call and um, uh, hopeful could send a, a double message, you know, uh, uh, what are the features of a hopeful architecture? Is there a perennial model of a city uh, uh, more contextually in our doomed Mideastern region? Uh, we all pertinently know that Beirut has been historically destroyed and rebuilt seven times, not to mention the Civil War sequels and the latest mega blast. It has been reconstructed each and every time only to be damaged, to, to, to get damaged again and again. What if such an omnipresent dystopian uh, uh, um, um, uh, mood or a uh, uh, dystopian dimension lurks and looms, entering more and more into play? What if paranoia, psychosis, animosity become architectonic components? Uh, uh, by extension, active territorial protagonists. How could Beirut embrace its unglamorous reality in an everlasting reconstruction of its own frailty? The only thing we know, feel, and experience in our daily vécu is that everything revolves around some existential pattern, a never-ending duel, duel, uh, duel between existence and demise. Uh, quoting Lars uh, Spoolbrook in his book on the radical picturesque, uh, um, it is a construction of frailty, not strength. So back to the keyword, uh, uh, just to try to answer uh, your question a bit uh, more in, in, in a, a more specific way to the student projects. Uh, back to the keyword mayhem, we redefine mayhem as a set of renewed opportunities. 
rising against all frozen mentalities and frightened uh, perceptions to undermine any petrified form of status quo, whether ideological or pragmatical, at any architectural or urban scale. Mayhem postulates the following. Architecture is no savior, although the architecture is far from being a mere anecdote. The Mayhem paradigm shifts the spatial fiction into a counterculture. It replaces, uh, it replaces the positivistic posture with a multiplicity of nihilistic speculative assets, ranging from subversive processes to conceptual strategies, lying somewhere in between inversion, digression, and dissidence. It distances itself from the dogmatic, the politically correct, the traditional systems of architectural production, while advocating for a pedagogical model of savagery. Mm. Here, alteration evolves into an alternate understanding of violence. So, and the digital medium helps us somehow to capture it, the, uh, captured through digital tooling. So the body of mayhem is inclusive. It remains inclusive of other spatial linguistics, those we normatively perceive as the aesthetics of the ugly, the gruesome, the grisly, the hideous, the indigestible, the impure. Uh, quoting Spurbrook again, uh, life is not something stored in, stored in biological creatures. Hybrids or bastards can be more alive than the purified versions, naturally, because they are imperfect while impure. Imperfection is in some sort essential to all what we know of life, of a state of progress and change. Nothing that lives is or can be rigidly perfect. Part of it is decaying, part of it is nascent. Uh, that's maybe, that was maybe one of the motives uh, that uh, pushed me uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the direction of, um, in, in, of labeling the, 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 the academic exercise uh, digital renaissance. So uh, the envisioned territorialities in an uncertain digital renaissance or reconstruction, if you wish, mm -hmm. a digital reconstruction, do not aim to bring nor ground any immediate or conclusive solution to the real. Trapped henceforth in between simulacra and simulation, in reference to Jean Baudrillard's theories. Instead, they explore a wide palette of notions, establishing useful correlations between figure and transfiguration, matter, memory, uh, and loss of information, synthetic eco ecologies and typologies of destruction, dismantlement acts and self exhaustions toward, towards ruin formation finitude as or infinitude as stipulated in the Heideggerian philosophy of the metaphysical. So um, to um, try to conclude, uh, um, mayhem uh, is, is some kind of a deadly kiss. It is about embracing death, or as Tariq Naga would put it, depth instead of death. So um, I would like to um, to uh, close on, on, on one um, um, quote that I uh, somehow love and uh, that um, marked me in a way in my uh, architectural formation, and it's back to 1979 with the Himmel Blau's manifesto of, uh, around the poetry uh, of desolation. So if there is a poetry of desolation, then it is the aesthetics of the architecture of death in white sheets, death in tiled hospital rooms, the architecture of sudden death on the pavement, death from a rib cage pierced by a steering shaft, the path of a bullet through a dealer's head on 42nd Street, the aesthetics of the architecture of the surgeon's razor sharp scalpel, the aesthetics of peep show sets in washable plastic boxes, of the broken tongues and the dried up eyes. And that is how buildings have to be unpleasant, rough, pierced, blazing, like an erected angel of death. So, I hope that brings a bit of uh, um, atmosphere uh, to the general um, frame of, uh, of the probing the body of mayhem to, uh, in order to uh, recreate a digital renaissance of it. Thanks, Samer, for this. I think it <laughs> brings me back to when I was your student <laughs> at Alba, where we used to design emergency cities and actually never thought that we would actually have to experience that one day. Um, 
I think when you mentioned the, the death of the author, I think at the same time, uh, Umberto Eco proclaimed the, the birth of the open work, and which I think is very relevant to Beirut. And I wonder if you think this approach is uh, the way to go, where you design something, leaving a big part of it uh, open to the next generation that's going to come. I know it failed with the metabolist movement in Japan, but in a way, Beirut is a city that has so many changes, I think, over the time. And I don't know if that's something that instead of the death of the author, we can look at the open work. And I wonder if the students may be interested in that as well. Why not? <laughs> I'm glad to intersect with you, Aude, uh as well, a um, few years later. So, um, yeah, I think your, uh, your argument could uh, rebalance. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's experimentation and speculative work is always open to other dimensions and to other interpretations. So there is no uh, finitude uh, in, in, some, in some sense to it. So uh, uh, the, 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 what I had to do is some, after my, my, uh, the, my students, um, after the fact that after the, the final uh, outcome of the of the studio, I had to somehow try to synthesize all of those uh, sensibilities and try to to uh, to make them fit in one body of work. Uh, somehow that that joins them uh, all, all together, and at the same time, that uh, would maybe make make them diverge. So um, it is about um, a, a divergent dimension of the work that uh, interests me here. So, um, uh, voila, that's it. I, I think I want to say too. <laughs> Frederick, I'm curious to know what you think about... Uh, Frederick had so, some reactions. I could see him. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he had a few reactions. And yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm curious because Frederick seems to know a lot about psychoanalysis. And you mentioned some terms that have to do with psychoanalysis. No, you said you said paranoia as an architectural component, and that this is what the studio explores. Um, I think maybe we could also think of uh, you know certain dichotomies that you draw, you know, between uh, <clears throat> figure and and transfiguration. Uh, um, uh, so I, I'm very curious to see what what Frederick thinks about all that because. You know, because well, I, I can't help but think that you know, your two presentations are related. Well, I think all of the presentations were related, which is no doubt down to your kind of um, sage uh, curatorship. Um, I would say, I mean, look, there was, there was a lot of really interesting stuff in there, uh, Samer, and I, I, we don't know each other, uh, but I'll definitely try and see if we can connect after the symposium. It'd be very interesting. Sure, uh, pleasure. I think um, there's quite a few ways of sort of coming at this. Um, I think you at some point said something about sort of uh, whether death could be something that is sort of liberating. And then you said about sort of having sort of death rather being in the plural rather than in the singular. Um, and of course, I think that sort of ties back a little bit to to this kind of the the, the last sort of part of my presentation, which was where I sort of tied um, everything back to the, the sort of the aria that they use in the artwork, which is the Liebestod from uh, the last aria from um, Tristan and Isolde. And Liebestod, of course, means the love of death. And essentially, um, that last aria is about sort of the two lovers, Tristan and Isolde, um, having sort of taken, ingested some kind of poison. And, and Isolde has this kind of vision of, of um, Tristan's resurrection. And there's something very interesting in that because the artists um, that, I'm, that sort of directed this artwork, they dedicate the artwork to the, quote, doomed lovers of Beirut. And so in doing so, they sort of imply both that there is this kind of um, destruction going on around them and this sense of an ending, but also they evoke through this kind of spectral um, haze, some kind of resurrection, you know? Um, so through the delirium, there's, there's, there's the chance of something new arising. Um, 
And so, so there's lots of interesting things there. And, you know, you mentioned the death of the author. I think in general, um, you know, it's, it, it, it's very few sort of cities or urban um, settlements that you would argue has only one single author because the minute people live in them, they set about to sort of reconfiguring them to their own kind of wishes and desires. So that's a, that's a sort of a separate conversation, but um, yeah, very interesting. I'd be very interested in continuing the conversation. I'm aware that we're running out of time. So um, I'll, I might just end my comment there. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. Does anyone have anything um, to add? Thank you, Riyad. The solicitation, the smooth follow-up, and uh, the whole uh, wonderful house hosting. So. Uh, I personally uh, was uh, really privileged to, to be the proud ambassador of such a bunch of 20 talented Lebanese uh, Alba students. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Riyad. Thanks, Riyad. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess uh, we will get back at 4.30, so in 30 minutes. Um, yeah, and I would really like if the speakers are here and they also take part in the conversations. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think uh, it's going to be a good one. All right. Great. Thank you so much for coming and thank you so much for the presentations and to the audience for uh, uh, participating. For participating. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.